Hey guys, I'm back, and if you're wondering where I've been for the last couple weeks, uh, a certain king called the Banners, and let's just say I was really needed beyond the wall. But anyways, before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know that for the month of August, all revenue that I earn from the channel will be donated to the Canadian Mental Health Association. I made a long and sappy post on Facebook about why I'm doing it, which I'll put a link to in the description of the video. But if you'd like to help out, all you have to do is watch my videos, really. Or if you want to, you can donate directly to the charity, which I'll also put a link to in the description. With that out of the way, sorry again for the wait, and please enjoy the video. Cersei donned a look of hurt. You wrong me, daughter. All I want is- Is your son. All for yourself. You'll never have a wife that you don't hate. And I am not your daughter, thank the gods. Leave me. Born the youngest of Mace Tyrell and Alary Hightower's four children is Marjorie Tyrell. We know very little about her life growing up in Highgarden. In fact, we don't even meet her until the second book in the series. And with a real lack of Tyrell point of view in the books, our information about her is very second-hand. So I think first we have to start with another character that we did meet earlier on in the series, who knew the value of getting Marjorie onto the chessboard. Now, it's blink and you miss it, but the first time we hear about Marjorie is in the first book, when Hand of the King Eddard Stark is approached at court by King Robert Baratheon's younger brother. Renly jokingly asks Ned if he thinks that the picture in the locket bears a resemblance to his late sister Lyanna Stark. But when Ned says no, Renly seems oddly disappointed. It isn't until both King Robert and Ned Stark die that Renly reveals what he had been planning. Renly, like a few other people, had been suspicious of the fact that Robert's children weren't actually his, but fearing what Cersei would do, or that Robert just wouldn't believe him, he attempted to subtly work against their marriage by trying to arrange for Robert to fall in love and marry Marjorie, ousting Queen Cersei. Marrying Marjorie himself, which he later did do, was really only his plan B, in order to cement more popularity and wealth for his own campaign for the throne. But, of course, after Renly himself is killed by Melisandre's shadow magic, the Tyrells are left with a choice. They could fight the Lannisters with Stannis, who they knew even Marjorie would never have a chance of marrying, or look to the unwed Lannister bastard already on the throne. At the Battle of the Blackwater, the Tyrell forces were instrumental in the victory against Stannis' attack on the capital. Joffrey ended up dismissing his current fiancée of Sansa Stark, in favor of a marriage with Marjorie, and at their wedding feast, Joffrey was secretly poisoned by Marjorie's grandmother, Elena. Before Joffrey's body was even cold, Marjorie started influencing the younger, gentler, and much more naive new boy king, Tommen. She married him soon afterwards, and proved herself to be a kind and well-loved queen by both the court and commoners. That is until... Uh, no, no, not, not quite. There we go. Cersei gets wise to what Marjorie is doing with her son, and ends up getting her arrested by the newly instated Faith Militant for adultery and treason against the crown. When Cersei informs her that her only choice of champions for the trial by combat are the cowardly Boros Blount and the aging Mirren Trant, Marjorie, who before it always appeared kind to Cersei, angrily lets her know that she's wise to Cersei's plans to get her away from her son and the throne. As it stands right now, Marjorie is in the custody of Randall Tarly, choosing a trial by the Faith, and not buying into Cersei's rigged game of a trial by combat. Marjorie and her brothers share many things. The first is talent. Willis is a scholar, Garland and Loras with swords and lances, and Marjorie with her political astuteness. The second is determination and grace in the face of a challenge. Whether facing an invasion, fighting in a battle, seeking glory in a tournament, or being in prison, the Tyrells will be there not only facing it, but also making it look easy. Lastly is their courteousness. Whether they all put it on falsely or not doesn't really matter. How you act when you're at court mingling with other highborns is how you form a reputation. And the Tyrells have mild manners and a well-bred disposition down to an art form. However, Marjorie shines the brightest in all of these categories, and has another important thing going for her that any gardener can tell you is essential. Patience. Let's look at the history of A Song of Ice and Fire. How many times has acting impulsively gotten characters killed, maimed, or crippled? Seriously, pause the video and count them all. I want to see how many you can list in the comments. Now, it's not only that, but her ability to read and charm someone based on her personality alone is exceptional, never faltering to find the words or actions she needs to take. This woman rides confidence better than Bran rides Hodor. Due to a real lack of Tyrell point of view in the books, it's hard to know if these actions are genuine, but Marjorie understands that rulership is a slow burner. 
If you want someone to be loyal to you for the long haul, then you need to appeal to them on an emotional level, accessing them where they're the least rational and most likely to let their guard down. Marjorie uses her intelligence not to strike at the Lannisters like Rob or Stannis, but to get closer to them. She could have poisoned Joffrey the first minute they were alone together, but it would seem a little too obvious if the king suddenly died after just getting close to a new girl. She knew Joffrey wasn't going anywhere, so why risk doing it right away? Instead, she and her grandmother waited patiently, but never idly. Marjorie was working overtime to not only win over the king, but also every commoner, lord, and knight in the city, using her perceived innocence and kind demeanor. Then, when it all seemed that Marjorie couldn't be any less suspicious, that's when they were able to do him in. Rob, Sansa, Arya, Stannis, Tyrion, and many others had way more reason than anyone to kill the most hated character in the series. But, with the help and guidance of her grandmother, it was a 16-year-old who knew when to be opportunistic, when to be patient, always to speak kindly, and above all to never break character, who was able to do what others with armies in the tens of thousands couldn't even come close to doing. When people typically think of strong female characters in media, their mind usually goes to those with literal strength. You know, the girls who can fight the system or work outside their perceived gender roles. But what about the women who, instead of fighting the system, worked within it to achieve their goals all the same? Marjorie doesn't need to break out of her gender role by picking up a sword to be considered strong. A lot like Sansa is learning now, she works within the terrible social positions that women were put in back then to move forward and even start to control the game. People expect her to be virginal and innocent, so she does exactly that. It's basic psychology when you think about it. When you act like someone expects you to, they can wrap their head around who you are and can categorize you into a box that they can understand. And this gives them a sense of security because they know what to expect from you. But of course, Marjorie has a very obvious foil in Cersei Lannister. Throughout A Feast for Crows, we see Cersei build up an obsession with Marjorie. Everything she does adds fuel to the crazy fire inside of her head, and Cersei is Marjorie's biggest threat for one reason. And that's that you can't really charm the excessively paranoid who knows from first-hand experience exactly what game you're playing. And especially when this person staunchly believes in a prophecy that says that you're out to get her. And it's because of Cersei for the first time we finally get to see Marjorie crack. And while Marjorie was happy to play nice before, it's safe to say that now the gloves are off. Now, we're waiting to see if Marjorie makes it through her upcoming trial. It seems like if there's one person who could charm her way out of something like this, it's her. Until you look at her most obvious historical parallel of Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII, her life bears a scarily similar one to Marjorie's. Someone saw her as a threat, she was accused of crimes she didn't commit, and in the end, she was executed. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and share it with your friends and subscribe. I'll see you guys soon for a new Westeros Brawls. Take care.